Welcome to week eight. We are working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is, we just looked at Jesus' teachings on anger, and now we're moving to lust. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. I think this is going to be a really helpful talk today. Grace and peace to you. So last week, the week before, we looked at Jesus' teachings on anger. And today we're going to move into his teachings on lust as we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know about you, but going from, going from the topic of anger to lust, I'm going to need some help in all of this. I need a new heart. Now, let me start at the outset, ladies. I, don't, I cannot get inside your head, but I know the head and the mind of men. And I know that lust for the opposite sex is something that all men struggle with. Ladies, I assume there's some of that in your life, but there's also lust in general, the lust that Satan's big lie, this will make me happier. I want that. I want what I don't have. So don't tune out on me because this entire study today is going to be helpful for all of us. For, for after all, Jesus said, I don't want you. I don't want you looking with lust in your heart. So let's, let's kind of try to figure this out. I'm going to need help with this. I'm going to need help with, can I, can I be angry and not sin? Well, that's a fact. Yes, I can be angry and not sin. Jesus became angry and did not sin. The Holy Spirit through Paul writes in John 4, in your anger, do not sin. But I don't know about you. I haven't been very successful with that. I have not done well at all not getting angry. And I have failed completely at not sinning in my anger. So the two questions I sent to the men as an introduction to this week's study is, number one, can we look and not lust at the opposite sex? And number two, can we look and admire and not lust? Well, the answer is yes to both of those. But just like not getting, not sinning in your anger, I'm not so sure that that's not a slippery slope that I want to stay away from. I've grown greatly in my walk with Jesus, and lust is not a big issue for me, but it's not going away, and my heart is, is deceitful above all else, Jeremiah, so why don't, why don't we look into this and understand what it is we're looking for? So right off the bat, let me remind you that we've been talking about the, our approach to life is, and perhaps our approach to guardrails, which we'll tease out in a moment, is on the first hand, it's lifeless. Then there's trying to do better, and then there's best. So lifeless is just saying, I'm not going to look. That's lifeless. That's trying to follow a rule. That's not going to work. Better is to employ some of these guardrails that we're going to talk about. If you're a man, I, again, I cannot get inside of women's heads, but I know there's some of this going on for sure. If, if you're a man, there's an attractive woman in front of you across the street. Avert your eyes. Do what these are good guardrails. We'll talk about those in a moment. But the best is having a heart that is so averse to anger, to greed, to fear, to lust, to idols in general, that there's no room in your heart for that. Your heart is averse to that. Now, that may, if you're a man and you're listening, that may seem like something that's unattainable. A heart that is so averse to, to that that even Okay, ladies, how about a heart that's so burst to anger that you push it out as soon as it tries to come into your heart and your mind and your soul? You're just not going to have it. Your heart won't allow it. And you may say that's not going to happen on this side of, of eternity. But I'll use this example. One of our men in one of the groups said that before he found Jesus, the year before he found Jesus, he went, as he always did, on a golf trip with his buddies. And after they had dinner, after they played golf and had dinner one of the first night, they went to a strip club. The next year after he had found Jesus, or let's say Jesus had found him, same routine, same schedule. Uh, no, I don't think I want to go to the strip club with y'all. I'm just going to go on back to the hotel room. And he told me, he said, my thought was, I'm not taking Jesus into a strip club. His heart had become averse to it. I, 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 I polled different various men's groups, and I said, how many of you men have been to a strip club in your life? And so many have. You know, when we were younger, we did stupid things. It was a thing to do. I, I rarely did, but yes, I did. And so I said, how many of you would go back now? And everybody's hand dropped. And I said, well, let's take it a step further. 
what is the percentage possibility that you would go to a strip club? Zero, zero. Well, that's a complete reversal in your heart. How many of you have taken tequila shots back when college or at some point and gotten so drunk you couldn't see straight? A lot of hands go up. Would you do that now? No. What is the percentage? Zero. Is it because you have to grit your teeth and try to discipline yourself not to succumb to that temptation? No. No, I don't, my heart's a burst to that now. So we can move deeper into the flow of the kingdom among us by looking at what Jesus said and taking it to heart. He's serious. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time and you're thinking, this guy is nuts. He is going way off the fundamentalist end of this thing. He's, he's talking about something that's just draconian. It's ridiculous. Trust me, this is helpful. Jesus would not have said, don't carry lust in your heart. Don't look to lust. He wouldn't have said it. If he thought it was good for us, he, he's always leading us into the path of the light, into the flow of the kingdom among us. So let's start with our heart. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Everything flows from a wellspring. From your heart will flow life. Guard your heart. Don't let things into your mind and into your heart that you don't want in there. Jesus puts it this way, and I'll read this, Matthew 15, 18, talking about eating back then. It was all, you know, is this a, is this a permissible thing to eat? Is it clean or unclean? And he says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these are the things that defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts. See, it's the evil thoughts. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but we have a divine power to demolish strongholds. So we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We have a divine power. When you have surrendered your life to Jesus, when you've been born again, the Holy Spirit indwells you, the same Holy Spirit that indwelled Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead. You think he can't handle something like this? Whatever issues you're dealing with, you think that's divine power inside of you cannot demolish the strongholds in your life? Not put a dent in, not put a scratch into, demolish. But we have a role to play in that. We have a role to play in, in changing our hearts. We cannot transform our hearts on our own. Jesus and Holy Spirit have to do that, but we can help. We have a role to play. So Jesus in Matthew 15, 18, he says, For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are actions that come from the thoughts that we allow to resonate and stick and nest into our hearts and our heads. Same way with anger. We have to grab those thoughts. We have to take them captive and make them obedient to Christ. You cannot let those thoughts nest in your head. You cannot let those sights, those visions, those things that you've looked at nest in your head. You know, there's a popular saying now, you cannot unsee that. You can't unsee that. But we're going to talk about things that we do not want to allow. We do not want to allow into our brains, into our hearts, into our thoughts. We want to grab them because they're coming our way. We do have an enemy in this in this life of ours, and it, is, and it is Satan, and he is real, and he is trying to trip you up. Remember Satan's three Ds, destroy, distract, discourage. Destroy, distract, discourage. If he can, if he can keep you out of a relationship with Jesus, and he would usually do that by distracting you and discouraging you. If he can keep you out of a relationship with Jesus, he's destroyed your life, your eternal life, and that, that's his number one goal. But if he loses that, and you are born again, and you are eternally saved, then he will spend the rest of your life trying to discourage you and distract you. Destroy, distract, discourage. He'll distract you. He'll discourage you. And so he's always coming in with your, trying to, trying to attack your weakest point. But you have a divine power to demolish strongholds. This is not, we're not operating from a position of weakness. We're operating from a position of strength if we would only appropriate that. Satan's only ploy is to bluff you. He has no real power. 
I'm not afraid of him. I know he's a worthy adversary and I'm not going to pick a fight with him, but I'm not afraid because I have the Holy Spirit. I have a divine power to demolish strongholds, whatever stronghold you are dealing with. And I'm sure there's more than one. You cannot just put a dent in it or scratch it up pretty good. You can demolish it. So let's take an example of what Satan is trying to do and, and think through what were the mistakes that were made and Satan took advantage of it. Genesis 3.1. Now let's watch this. And I want you, as we read this, I want you to think in terms of what was Eve's mistake. Now, let me say right up front, Adam clearly by the reading was with her. So it's not all on Eve. She's just the one talking. But what was her, she made two mistakes in this. So let's start. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, do not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now let's stop. What was her first mistake? She engaged with Satan. She didn't grab that first thought, his first attempt at a conversation. With us, it's that thought that pops into your head, that temptation, that thought, that vision, that, that old picture in your head. She allowed it to continue. She engaged. She didn't stop it at the beginning. And it was pretty much over because she... She's, de she's, she's dealing with someone who's way craftier than she is, and so are you. So you stop it right off the bat. You take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. She did not do that. And, and once he gets her going, she's misquoting God. You must not touch it. God didn't say that. So now Satan's got her going. And here's the next mistake. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She looked at the fruit, and she continued to look at it, and that was her second mistake. No guardrails in her life towards not looking. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So there's old Adam. He's complicit. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed big leaves together. How pathetic is this? And made covering for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I love that. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called them, now where are you? Now let me assure you, God is not asking that question for information. It's more of the question of where are you now, Adam, that you've done this? Look at, look at where you are now. Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, and who told you you were naked? Satan, the old bait and switch. Eve should not have engaged. She should have grabbed that thought and made it captive to, to her heavenly father before it ever started to take a net and build a nest in her, her heart and in her mind. Well, let's go down one step further. Genesis 3, 6, the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. Several thousand years later, 2000 years ago, the apostle John writes in his first letter, not his gospel, but his first letter, 1 John 2, 16, for everything in the world that is contrary to God, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They parallel perfectly. Good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasing to the eye, lust of the eyes. Desirable for gaining wisdom, the pride of life. Nothing's changed in all these thousands of years. As we see in the story with Cain, after Cain has killed his brother Abel, God says to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, sin is crouching at your door. Satan is crouching at your door. Temptation, self, the world. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. 
That's our part. There's a lot of things we can do to help change our hearts. I don't know, I don't think that I'll ever have, I know I will never have a 100% pure heart on this side of life, but I don't have to pollute my heart and make the process worse. So before we go any further, let's just step back a minute and talk about the things that for which we can lust, at which we can lust, for the things that other than the opposite sex, because see, the problem with lust is it feeds into a great lie of Satan. And that great lie is this will make you happy. Or this will make you happier. This will make life better. That's the big lie. It's right there in Genesis 3. Did God really say, God, no, he's trying to hold, hold out on you. So the big lie with lust is this will make me happy and, and therefore I have to have it. Lust really means I got to have it now because it'll make me happier. And then we then our minds roll in as we allow those thoughts to, to roll and we don't grab them, make them captured to, to Jesus. Then the next thought is after this will make me happy is I have to have it to be happy. I cannot be happy without it. And then the next thought, if we haven't grabbed that one, it continues to roll on. I deserve this. And then if you're walking with Jesus and you start to hear that or feel that Holy Spirit red light, mm -mm, Sam, stop. No, don't keep going. Then Satan jumps in and says, just like he did with Eve, God's holding out on you. He's not coming through for you. And so we take matters on our own hand. And we end up sowing figurative fig, fig trees around us, fig leaves, and hiding in the bushes. So what are some of the things that after which we can lust? Now, I'll start right off being transparent. Back when I was in my 20s, late 20s, I was developing subdivisions. I was a hot shot. I wore suspenders. I wore my hair wet. had a mustache. I was a hot shot doing real well, really full of myself, didn't know Jesus. And I had a friend who drove a 750 BMW, a 750 BMW. And I lusted after that BMW. I did. I lusted. I might as well have drooled. I lusted after that BMW. Years before, I owned horses. And I ended up with saddlebred. Saddlebreds are beautiful horses. And I would go to these saddlebred shows, and I'd see these magnificent animals, these 17 hand high that's a tall big horse with this incredible head and, and beautiful mane and tail and, and and stockings on their feet white feet and and i would lust after those horses not lust to own them to ride them so what are some of the things that you might lust for i started with the 750 bmw it could be cars I see a real phenomenon amongst men my age and even the men Britain's age, my daughter's age, trucks. And when I brought this up in the men's meeting, I saw a lot of heads nod. Yeah, I do. I lust after that bigger truck. A lot of men that I know that play golf, they lust after that next golf cart. Or they hunt, they lust after that next shotgun. Or friends that, that shoot, that own guns, they lust after that next handgun. What is it for you? That next tennis racket, being a member of that particular country club, having that house, having that lifestyle, you can travel, you don't have to work so hard, life just seems so good. There's always got to be a certain amount of envy when you're lusting after what somebody else owns. You may just be in the store and see something close, but I have to have that. How many things have we bought in our life that we thought would make us happy? That we thought, I have to have that to be happy. There's so many things for which we lust, after which we lust, that we don't think of it that way. But the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is Jesus said, I don't want you lusting in your heart. Now, he did tie it to adultery, but I want you to understand this is a phenomenon that's going on. And if we don't address it by taking those thoughts captive and making them obedient to Jesus, grabbing them, if it takes that figuratively in your mind, mentally grabbing that thought and kicking it out, then off we go. And how many mistakes have been made in life because I got to have that or I got to have that person to be happy. Okay, 
now we'll actually move towards lust and the opposite sex. And I, I sort of put this title at the top of the handout, the no fun police or a slippery slope. Is Jesus just being the no fun police? Am I just being the no fun police? Am I just being too, just a little too Mormonish or strict, you know, a fundamentalist? I want to read you something that C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, and I'm just going to read two paragraphs, two short paragraphs. But he's talking about chastity and the sexual inclinations and appetites that have happened in our society. And in, in, in this little this little section is called Bent Appetites. Chastity is the most unpopular of the Christian virtues, he writes. There is no getting away from it. The Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to one's spouse or else total abstinence. Now, he says, this is so difficult, so contrary to our instincts the, that obviously either Christianity has got it wrong or our instincts have got it wrong, as it now is. One or the other. Of course, being a Christian, he says, I think it is the instinct that has gone wrong. And then he gives a couple of thoughts, and then he finishes with this. You can get a large audience of men together to look at a striptease act. Imagine if you went to a country where you had a large audience of people to watch on a stage as a covered plate was slowly opened as the lights went down to reveal a plate of food. Would not you think something had gone terribly wrong in that country's society when it comes to food? It's just another indication that something that the Lord made, which was very healthy and very helpful and very good sexual instinct, it, admiring the opposite sex, has been turned upside down by Satan. So here are Jesus's words, Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, and here's the way this language actually reads, for the purpose of lusting, for the purpose of leering, for the purpose of fantasizing. So yes, you can look and not lust. Yes, you can admire and not lust. But I think it's a slippery slope. And I think you're probably fooling yourself if you're a man. And you're telling me that you look and admire and you don't lust? That may be. That may be. Good for you. But it's a slippery slope. And I'm not so sure you're aware of your own self and what's going on. But anyone who looks at a woman lustfully for the purpose of lusting has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What are we going to do with that? Well, let's... let's Stop for a moment, because I, I want you to understand, Jesus is not teaching this just to be the no fun police. He wants the best for you. When he says, I don't want this in your heart, it's for your own good. But not just for your own good, because you're not an idol. So I broke it down with the men. I said, let's start with, if you're a man, let's start with our wives. And you look at, around. You look at other women. What is, what is this doing? Well, it, even if your wife isn't around, it's disrespecting her. Even if your wife isn't around, isn't around it's comparing her. It's creating, as, as, it's creating this objectivity. If others see you doing it, it's so disrespectful to your wife. If your wife is around, you're hurting her feelings. You're making her feel inadequate. There is nothing good about it. What about your children, your son? Because what I do, what I do with the men, and each time we talk about this, I bring a man up in front, and we stand so that, he, that everybody, in the, all the men in the group can see him, and I will say, now I want you to try to real quickly and real slyly look at my chest. Do it so quickly and so slyly that nobody sees it. And, of course, they try. And everybody sees it. And it's a big laugh and everybody jokes. But my point is, you're not getting away with this. When my daughter, Britton, in high school, worked at Wild Wings as a hostess, she came back after three or four days and said, Dad, men are disgusting. They are sick. They are awful. We see what they're doing. And some of these men are the parents of my friends. She was grossed out by it. So your son sees you doing it, and he says, you know, dad did it. There's nothing wrong with it. Your daughter sees you doing it, and she starts to lose respect, or she thinks all men are like this. 
she starts to dress so that men will look at her like that. There's all kind of problems with this. You are not an island with this. This is not just something that you think is funny and you're doing it. Your heavenly, your, your heavenly father, your Lord and Savior, your best friend Jesus said, this is not for you. This is not in the flow of the kingdom of mind. So your wife, your children, what about others? They see you doing this. Either they consider you to be a hypocrite or you're nothing special because they think they're a Christian. They go to a Christian church and they, they know that you've got, that you claim to be born again. You're doing the same thing they're doing. What about that woman that you're looking at, whether she sees you or not, and in all likelihood, she does see you. Or women, if you look at men, what are you doing? You're objectifying. You're, you're treating that, that, that creation of your heavenly father with that kind of disdain. What about you? What's it doing to you? See, every now and then I'll, I'll be talking with a younger man and they'll admit they're looking at porn. They'll admit they're sleeping around. And I'll say, look, I'm, again, I'm not trying to be the no fun police, but you're going to regret the things you're putting into your mind. There'll come a time in your life when you won't want those things in your mind and you won't be able to get them out. You'll regret this later. What's it doing to you as a person when you're looking at the opposite sex with that lusting sense? It's darkening your heart. It's polluting your heart. It's dirt in the carburetor. Whether you want to call it slop or you want to call it sin, it's dirt in the carburetor. And then what about Jesus? You're hurting him. You're disappointing him, but you're hurting him. You're looking at him with your eyes, and he's seeing it's just there's. When I brought this up with one of the group, one of the men's groups this week, one man said, that's reason enough to stop. It's like that man said earlier, I'm not going to that strip club and take Jesus into the strip club with me. My friends, it's a slippery slope. And Jesus says, I don't even want you getting on that slope. I want you to stay in the flow of the kingdom among us. So let's talk for a minute about guardrails. See, it's lifeless to say, I'm not going to look, I'm, you know, I'm, or I, it's lifeless to say, I'm going to look, but it's just a misdemeanor. Better is creating some guardrails. So Jesus gives us some guardrails. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your, than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, he, that is a literally true statement. It is a whole lot better to gouge your eye out if that could keep you from going to hell. That is a literally true statement. But it doesn't mean it that way because clearly you got gouge an eye out. You got another one. You got a brain. It's you. You know, you could gouge your eye out. You could cut your right hand off. You could roll into heaven, roll up to the gates of heaven as a mutilated stump. But if you still have an evil heart, you're not. You're not going in. So what are some things we can do with our eyes? We can look away. If you're a man, and I'm just being blunt. You keep your eyes above the neck. If you're walking down the street and a, an attractive woman is coming your way or she's out in front of you, cross the street. When I'm walking with Dina in Charleston, where there are so many women dressed inappropriately, hundreds of opportunities to lust. I don't want her to ever think I'm looking at another woman instead of her. So when I, if I see it coming, I just look, what, just engage her in conversation as we walk by. I'm not even going to chance trying to sneak a look in. I'm not going to disrespect her that way. There are things we can do short of gouging our eyes out, but these are guardrails. Remember, we want to have a heart that's changed, but these are things we can do. Jesus says, uh, another guardrail. If you if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it out, and throw, cut it off, and throw it away. It's better again to go in with with only one hand than to be tossed into hell with the whole body. What are some of the things we can do ourselves? Well, it's very difficult to watch a movie anymore without a sex scene in it. Let's say it's, and I have lots of movies that I love that are great movies, but they seem to have a sex scene. You can fast forward through that. You can change the channel. You cannot watch it in the first place. You can get rid of those magazines. 
just think about, I've noticed this with, with women, not so much men, men have all their other issues. They're lusting at things. I've seen a lot of women looking through these magazines all the time. And there's a lot of things in there. I'm sure that in their heart, they're looking at it saying, I, if I had that, I'd be happy, or I want that, or I need that, or I deserve that. If there are any kind of magazines coming into your home and you're a man, you can just get rid of those magazines. There are things we can do, my friend, to stop this process in our minds, to help the Holy Spirit transform us into different people. But what the kind of heart we want is the kind of heart that is so averse that there's just no room in our hearts for any of these other things. I want to close with one of my favorite passages. First John 4, 18. Now, this is Sam's artwork, so don't laugh. But the best, better is guardrails. Best is no thanks, I'm full. First John 14, there, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. For, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love drives out fear. So what I've got here in my cryptic circle is your heart. And in your heart is fear and anger and lust and greed and idols and whatever else you want to throw in there. But each circle making inroads into your heart is Jesus' perfect love. It's your heavenly father's perfect law. And the more you receive that, the more you live in that, the more you pursue that, the more you remind yourself of his perfect love and you bask and you live in his perfect law. As you go deeper, that perfect love drives out. It drives out the fear. It drives out the anger. And then you go deeper and it drives out lust. And you go deeper and it drives out greed. And you go deeper and it drives out all these other idols that we're carrying around in our hearts. And as perfect love continues to do its work and moves towards completion, our hearts get to the point where there's just no room for these other things. And at that point, we can say, no thanks, I'm full. Yes, that used to be attractive to me, or that used to even have a stronghold on me. Yes, that used to be something that I lusted for, or that I thought I had to have. No, you know, you know what? My heart's full now. No thanks, I'm full. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm not saying it's bad. Whatever it is that I was looking at or I wanted in my life, my heart's full now. No thanks, I'm full. That is the heart that Jesus wants for us, to be filled. He said, I I've come so that you would have life and have it to the full. Just look in the New Testament how many times you'll see the word full or fulfilled or full. It is, it is the goal. So, my friends, we can do this. We can purify our hearts. Jesus wants it for you, and he'll help you. One last thing. The statistics are overwhelming about men, and I guess women too, and it is a growing number of women who identify as Christians but admit to watching porn. The common statistic for men is 70%. If you're looking at porn, it has to stop. And if you need my help or someone else's help, which you will need somebody else's help, it's got to stop. It's not a laughing matter. It's not just something you can do on the side. It is poison in your brain. Poison. So thank you for joining in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this. I want you to listen to this last closing. There's more. You know it. Come and find it. Grace and peace be with you.